for, for this conversation. I love this chart, by the way. Thank you. Um, it, let me, uh, I, I understand one of my colleagues talked about it, but I, I'm just going to put a finer point on this because I understand in this conversation just highlights the fact that um, our, a rapid increase in projected electricity demand is happening because of AI, because of data centers. And I know this in Nevada because we actually have both happening here and we are a major hub for data centers. Um, you just have conversations with the switch in my state on this very topic. So I am very interested in how we address that demand, and I think it is everybody's responsibility to figure this out if we want to lead in this country in emerging technology, right? So uh, if you have any additional information, I would love to hear it on how we address and, and be a part of the solution here to address that, that emerging demand as well. Uh, Ms. Fu? Yes, um, this is something, as I mentioned earlier, something that the department is laser focused on. And I think it is due to our role in leadership in advanced computing, understanding what the energy needs of AI will be, but also in our role with the energy part of our, our, our name. Um, we see an enormous opportunity here. It is true that energy demand is growing, it's doubling. Energy demand from data centers is doubling from a very low base. However, it is a local issue that we need to really grip, uh, get our heads around. We think that DOE has a really unique role here in helping to convene stakeholders. This is something that the Secretary has been thinking through. She's charged her Secretary Energy Advisory Board to look at this issue, and they recently came out with recommendations. We'd be happy to share them. We are starting to implement and look through um, those recommendations and see what we can do. We'll be convening stakeholders around the country in areas of high load growth. This is going to be an, area, an effort um, over the next several months. We do think that there are things that we can do now. And I think part of the challenge with AI load growth is that it is both a very large load and the expectations are very fast. You know, they need, this large load is going to come online in the next few, now through the next few years. And so we have many different kinds of technologies that we're looking at that are going out to 2030. We're doing everything that we can to look at what we can unlock now. Permitting, of course, is one piece of that. We have actually an AI and permitting pilot that we have already launched to see how we can use AI to expedite and streamline the permitting process. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we've been able to do is to take the entire corpus of NEPA documents, which normally go in a huge binder and get put on the shelf, and make them AI ready, digitize, digi digitize them and make them available to the entire scientific community and to industry to develop new tools to help with this process. But we know that there is near-term needs, mid-term needs, and longer-term needs, and DOE is focused on all of those. And I know you are because of your footprint in Nevada, by the way, and so thank you. My, my only ask is, and you talked a little bit about you invite industry in to have them part of the solution. I, I talk with the CEO switch regularly, and, and I just talked to him about this issue. They have ideas. Yes. Right. And, and so they should be part of this discussion. Absolutely. Nevada is a perfect place to have this discussion because of DOE's footprint, but also there is this nexus between energy and water and the challenges we have there. There is also in Nevada a large footprint just of the federal government that should be partnering with state private sector in figuring this out. And for that reason, I am hoping DOE is also partnering with the Department of Interior. You talked a little bit about permitting, but it's Department of Interior that has owns a lot of the land, right? So I'm hoping that, and, and can you talk about that? Is there that partnership that's happening with other federal agencies, including the Department of Interior? Yes, there's a lot of focus on this. Uh, we're working through the CEQ that's convening the interagency body. I'll say the AI and permitting pilot, we're working with the 13 agencies in the permitting council on this issue. Um, and we've recently, through Savannah River National Lab, issued an RFI that looks at potentially siting data centers even on federal land. Okay. So we're looking at all of these issues, looking at all of these options. We understand the urgency of the issue. Okay. And, and the only other uh, stakeholder that must must be at the table is our state. Uh, and local uh, folks, right? Because w we manage uh, our economic development, our population growth, our needs with the federal government because the federal government owns most of the land in the state. So I'm hoping that you pull our folks in as well in this conversation. It is crucial. Thank you. You talked a little bit about workforce to, that we need for the future. W what else should we be aware of here in Congress that we have to focus on, particularly for that workforce of the future that is going to kind of lead and be a part of these uh, emerging technologies. Anything that, that we didn't talk about? 
that I need to know or we need to know? Happy to happy to take that on. I think, uh, Senator, that that is an incredibly important question that is at the heart of this competition. The population of the PRC is four times ours. Right. They are producing four times as many bachelor grad, bachelor degree holders in STEM, twice as many masters, and twice as many PhDs. This is not a competition that we faced in the Cold War. Their po the population of the Soviet Union was nearly as much as ours. The economy was far below, and here the population is much higher, much more talent to tap into, and they have these sophisticated programs that they're trying to bring more talent into their country. Right? Uh, I'll give you the example. Uh, they have this national innovation-driven development strategy, which aims for the PRC to become a key hub for global high-end talent by 2050. Now, they've changed their visa and permanent residency programs. They've established a 1,000 foreign talents program alongside the 1,000 talents program to recruit foreign nationals to China. And I think we need to have a talent strategy here. Mm -hmm. What does our talent strategy look like? DOE has some fellowships for US nationals. I think uh, NSF has their own fellowships. For agencies have these, the, their work cut out here, but at the same time, there is a big chokehold that only this body can solve. And that is that, you know, I'll, I'll get, quote uh, the Singaporean leader, Li Yuan Ku, who said, when he was asked like, uh, whether he thought China would overtake the United States in the 21st century, he said, no, because the United States has long attracted the world's best and brightest. He said that uh, the United States fosters a diverse culture of creativity, and China will struggle to do so. Despite having 1.3 billion people to tap into, mm -hmm. the United States has 7 billion people to tap into, because we can assemble the rest of the world team. And I think you see that in AI today, 65% of the AI startups, of the top AI startups, have at least one person as a founder or co-founder who came here through legal immigration means. I think that is, has to be an important part of the conversation on workforce. Uh, so we need an all of the above approach here to be able to match the kinds of, the numbers that they're putting out in STEM PhDs and STEM masters, STEM bachelors. And then finally, and I agree, but that can be done, Dr. Kaushik, with what your caution was before, is how do we secure? How do we ensure we're securing the technology, right, for, for, for our use in our labs? There's a way to balance it, and you believe that can be done? Absolutely. There are, uh, you know, the, the guardrails I talk about, most of them the, are objectively laid out in what we call the National Security Decision Directive 189, which was issued during the Reagan administration during the Cold War about protecting American technological advantage. The National Academies also did a report in 2022 at the direction of this body on protecting US technological advantage, and they said that it is possible. Now, what do we need to do to actually get there? I think we have to recognize the competition's a bit different. Now, we cannot continue funding hypersonics research as basic research and saying that we will make that openly accessible. I think we have to classify the research when it needs to be classified. We have to have that conversation. A risk matrix cannot be a silver bullet. We have to have a broader conversation on what is okay to be made openly accessible and what needs to be behind closed doors, who needs, who should have access to certain research and who should not. And I think we need to be very careful about uh, whether it is even people from our partner and allied countries to be able to have access to those, uh, you know, the, those technologies that we are researching that are of sensitive nature. Research, it's, it's not just about preventing PRC access to those technologies. Sometimes we just don't want the fact that we are developing those technologies d disclosed. And I think there's a way we can balance that. And we've done, I think NSPM 33 does a really good job at it. It was, a st it was uh, produced by the Trump administration as an all of government approach. Uh, the Biden administration, to its credit, has continued working on it, despite OSTP's like, massive delays in releasing implementation guidance, it is the right approach. Uh, the Trump administration also issued the Presidential Proclamation 10043, which bars the entry of certain Chinese graduate and postgraduate students who have ties to military civil fusion institutions. And I think that is taking a scalpel rather than a sledgehammer to this. And that is the right way to go about it. Okay. Thank you. Senator. Senator.